Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Will you please stand as I read the word? This is from Psalm 113. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let his name of the Lord, let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with the princes, with princes of their people. Praise the Lord. How awesome is it that the God that looks down at the skies, the, the earth, and he's got that big view, and we must look so tiny, and yet, boom, right here. He's right here. And I'm so excited to worship him with you this morning.
right, Jean Norris is going to come up right now. Oh, but you can be seated in the meantime. This gospel of the I guess of the I need to just the whole world back there. And then the end will come. Reaching the whole world means going to hard places. There are more than 4,000 people groups that have not heard of the good news. That's 3 billion people living in darkness and without hope. Our calling as the Alliance is to go to these least reached people. The majority of the Alliance workers are in these remaining hard places, locations that are often hard to get to, where deep-rooted cultures are resistant to the gospel, places where ministry could carry the risk of imprisonment, deportation, or bodily harm, and even in locations that look easier economically or socially. Our workers are still doing very challenging ministry. We choose these places on purpose because they are in need of Jesus' presence. In 2004, my husband and I followed God's leading and moved to a hard place overseas. We faced constant obstacle and discouragement. And at one point, I broke down and cried out. I can't take this anymore. I want to go home. Nothing could be worth all this. As I collapsed in tears, I heard the Holy Spirit whispered, Jesus is worth it. He is worth it all. And because Jesus is worth it, the unreached people he loves are worth it. It's only because Jesus commanded that we go and make disciples of all nations that the gospel reached us. Now it is our turn. This will require greater partnership with the Global Alliance family. It will require us to equip and send workers from diverse backgrounds. This calling is going to take all of us working together as an alliance. The task of reaching the unreached is hard, but he is worth it all. Alliance family, would you join me in praying that God would open doors to hard places? Pray that he will call more workers to the harvest field. Give to the Great Commission Fund so that we can expand our work to even more hard places. Will we do our part? Will we be the generation to complete the Great Commission and take the good news to hard places? Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I am Jean Norris, and I am here to talk with you a little bit about missions. <clears throat> As we just watched uh, in the video, uh, it told us how our calling as, as part of the Alliance is to go to the unreached people. We choose places because they need Jesus. They need his presence, and as she shared, it's hard. It's not easy, but Jesus is worth it. The people are worth it. It's a reminder that reaching the unreached is hard, but ultimately, God is worth it. Join me and join her in praying that God will continue to open doors that God will continue to call and that people would hear the calling to go. And that funding for the Great Commission Fund would continue and even increase. To give you a little update on the chinchillas, uh, Melanie and Jose, I'm excited to tell you that Melanie will be joining us here in October for our missions conference. Um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, we had Jose here a few years ago, so it'll be nice to have Melanie come join us. Uh, we just got a newsletter from them uh, at the end of the week. If you are still not receiving their email and would uh, their their newsletter via email and would like to, please email uh, the church or office about getting on that list. Uh, or uh, back on the missions board, there is a uh, code that you can scan and, uh, and start receiving that newsletter. In the newsletter, Melanie and Jose shared that they are finally in their new apartment, which is awesome news. And one of the prayer requests that they shared was if you could please continue to be in prayer with them for the, uh, the future 
property uh, of the church. Their church, they've outgrown it and they need to move. And the building, the property that they are looking at is right near the central train station in Berlin, which would be an ideal location. Uh, so please be in prayer that all of the pieces fall into place and that they are able to, to get that. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, we do have their new address, again, out by the Missions Bulletin Board, if you would like that. We have their prayer cards over there. Uh, when you're doing your offering, if you'd like to give to the Great Commission Fund, absolutely awesome. If you would like your money to specifically go to the Chinchillas, please on your offering uh, envelope write Chinchilla or Germany so that those that are uh, counting the money will know that. Finally, we are called to missions. All of us are. So I want to ask you to please continue to be praying about how God is calling you. You're going to get tired of hearing me say this because I'm going to say this every month when I come up here. You are all, we are all called. How is God calling you? Is he calling you to be a prayer warrior? Is he calling you to be a financial supporter? Is he calling you to go? And maybe he's calling you to do all three. I don't know, but God knows. Please be in prayer of how he's calling you. If God is calling you and you are interested in uh, going on a short-term missions trip, please come talk with either myself or Marie Cole or Sarah Norris. Uh, we would love to share some more information about that possibility. Thanks. We're going to sing and worship again. <clears throat> so feel free to stand if you're able.
Thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, that you gave us breath in our lungs, that you have given us everything that we need, God. You supply. God, I thank you for the relationships that we have. I thank you for the relationships that are forming as new people are coming in. I pray, God, that you will continue to bless our church and to, God, rise up within us that spirit of compassion for not only ourselves, but for each other. Because that is going to be contagious, Lord God, and people will look and say, look at how they love each other. We desire to be that kind of a church, God. We want to reach out to our community. We want to build each other up. We want to grow. So thank you so much for this place that gives us that opportunity. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, it's that time. Children can be dismissed to promised land. Starting point. Yeah, starting point. <laughs> Come on up, Greg. Good morning, Gateway. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Norris. I am one of the elders here at Gateway. We are so <laughs> pleased that you are here worshiping with us today. Um, if you are visiting and it's your first time, you'll notice in the pews, or, or the pews, in the chairs in front of you, there are some slots, and one of those little cards says, uh, is an information greeting card. If you fill that out and then put it into the offering plate when it comes around, we would love to know that you're here and uh, be able to get more information from you for maybe later on. We'd also like to welcome Mike Heaton and his lovely wife Gretchen here today. They are going to be sharing with us. Yes, that, that's fine. Uh, announcements are really quick and brief as I'm trying to get into this three-week habit of you know, learning something new. Um, I've been talking about this for a while, but if you didn't get an announcement card or a bulletin on the way in, please make sure you do on the way out. And your assignment between now and next week is to buy a new or resurrect an old special magnet to hang on your refrigerator. I think everybody still has refrigerators in their house, right? Yeah. So before you go for the haagen -Dazs, check out the announcements. Um, we're going back and forth with you know verbal versus written. Right now we're gonna go with the written. Um, and ministry leaders, this is a new one. I'm just gonna ask for your help with this. If you could, 
Uh, make sure that anything that you want to have in the announcements gets to uh, Teresa by Wednesday. That'd be great. We're trying to get away from the, hey, it's 10 minutes before the service, and here's an announcement. Oh, it kind of throws us off a little bit. So if you could do your best to help us with that, that would be awesome. Um, gentlemen, come forward. God is good. And uh, we were blessed yesterday by our membership coming in and doing a really nice, thorough cleaning. Uh, we're not done yet, so you might hear more about it, but kudos to you as well. And thank you to the Lord for all of his blessings for every day, for every breath that we take. Let's bow in prayer for the offering. Lord, you know our needs before we even ask them. But you also like to see a willing and giving heart. Lord, just Bless us, continue to guide and direct us as we seek that new lead pastor. And let this offering today be used in an abundant way to glorify you and to take your good news to the ends of the earth. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand as you're able. We're going to continue worshiping. Bob, we're going to do the song twice. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit Caught up 
feels like to just soak in your presence, God. We pray, God, that during this time our hearts will be prepared for the words that Pastor has for us this morning. I pray, God, that each one of us would be waiting to hear from you about what part of this is going to prick our hearts or tap us on the shoulder or make us feel like you had us in mind when we walked in here today. And we thank you, God, for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, I guess I'll start out the same way everybody else does. For those of you that don't know me, <laughs> my name is Mike Heaton, and I served various different churches, but my occupation was as a civil engineer doing construction management. I did that for 45 years. Then I retired. And within 12 months, God took us to Africa, where I worked on a couple buildings for Wycliffe Bible Translators and a high school building for an international Christian school that my wife was librarian at. Oh, by the way, this is my wife, Gretchen. I've known, I've known her a while. After two years in Ethiopia, God changed my profession. He made me into a pastor. He says, now you're a pastor. And in 2020, after nine years in Ethiopia, we came home and our daughter said, come live close to us. So we're in Fayetteville. We go to the Syracuse Alliance Church. I'm the assistant pastor there. And I am just so happy to be with you all. You've made me feel, I think you've made both of us feel very welcome. This morning, we're going to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. And I'd like to start out with the, with the passage of Scripture that is the basis for this. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. So if you have your Bibles or your app, I have my Bible, but I'll tell you the truth. I got my whole sermon up here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as I of first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and that was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures Father we pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning, that you would speak your words through my mouth. Not my glory, Lord, your glory, and that you would speak to hearts this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now, I know Easter is gone. It's past. Gone are the Easter eggs, the chocolate bunnies, and the yellow marshmallow peeps. Those are my favorite. We see them everywhere at Easter, and they'll be back next year. But what is the real meaning of Easter? What does it really mean to us? N.T. Wright says, Easter is the beginning of God's new world. Easter is the celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But do we believe it happened? Many people reject the truth of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. Even, even those within our churches, even those that are Christians, 
If we believe it, what's our standard answer? The standard answer is, the Bible told me so. Or I learned it in Sunday school. How many of you could really defend if you were asked to do so? The fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, I like feedback on my sermons. <laughs> I used to run sound, so back way back when. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul quotes an early Christian creed that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Just how early is this creed? Sometimes the reliability of things is measured by how close they are to the actual event. Paul tells us he received this creed on his first trip to Jerusalem after his conversion. Now, Paul may have been as saved on the road to Damascus as early as two years after the crucifixion. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul tells us he waited for three years before returning to Jerusalem to verify his message with the apostles, to make sure they were all teaching the same thing. There he met with Peter and James, the Lord's brother. So Paul possibly received this creed as shortly as five years after the crucifixion and the resurrection. That means the creed was well established before Paul received it. It may have even been established in the first year. A creed like that is a statement of faith or a statement of belief. This is the basic belief that we have Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day. I'd like to look at three things this morning. The first one is the proof of Christ's death. We think the Bible has one whole book you know, we look at it and we say, this is my Bible. But actually, there are four books in there, each one independently written by a different person, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to give us an account of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Paul wrote his account in 1 Corinthians, probably about 55 AD. Mark, who was the first to write a gospel, probably about 66 AD. Matthew and Luke, probably 70s, early 80s, and John in the 90s. All of them either were there and saw it happen or researched it and heard it from some people who were there. This morning, each one of them gives accounts 
But this morning we're going to look at one account in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 34. Now, crucifixion was a common means of execution in the Roman Empire. It happened all the time. But it wasn't unique to the Romans. It started back in the Chaldean Empire, before Babylon. And there were three different ways of crucifixion. One, the man could be taken and set on a sharp pole. Could you imagine setting somebody on a sharp pole and he gets impaled? The second one involved the pole and the man's hands would be tied and tied to the pole above him. And he would pull down on the hands and eventually die of asphyxiation. The third, the one we think the most about, involves a crossbar pinned to a wall or pinned to a post. And the man would be tied or nailed to the crossbar. As his body weight carried him down, the muscles across his chest would tighten and he couldn't breathe. So to get a breath, he would have to push up with his feet, take a breath, and then his feet would hurt so much, he'd sag down on his arms again. This form of crucifixion was fairly quick. The Jews in John 19, verses 31, we read, Now it was the day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jews did not want the body left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. That's the only way a man could get a breath is by pushing up with his leg. And if his legs were broken, he died that much quicker. And the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And the man, okay. As we think about what happened, the Jews came because the next day was the Sabbath. I'd ask Pilate to have the legs of the men on the cross broken so that they would die quicker and could be taken down before the Sabbath started at sundown on Friday. There's another reason. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, one of the laws Moses gave to the Israelites says that if a man is guilty, a guilty of death, 
and he's hung on a tree or hung on a pole. He should be taken down before sundown and buried because he is a shame to God and leaving him there would cause shame on the entire country of Israel. Not only was it the Sabbath, but also they were taken down to meet the Jewish law that says you don't leave them overnight. The soldiers went around. At first they broke one man's leg. The thieves crucified with Jesus. And then they broke the other one. And when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't need to break his legs. And like it says in Psalm 34, verse 20, that his legs, that the righteous man, his bones will not be broken. Thus, scripture is fulfilled. And they pierced his side. The soldier wanted to check, so he stuck him in the side. If you stick a spear into the side, you get blood. He got blood and water. Around the heart is a sack. That sack is full of a clear liquid. If he stuck him in the side with a spear and pierced that sack, he would have gotten blood and water. But the other thing that might have happened very likely is he would have pierced the heart. And that in itself would have been a killing blow. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says, and they looked upon him who they have pierced. So we see these things happen. And they were as a fulfillment of scripture. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus who secretly, because he feared the Jews, At Pilate's, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus by night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body The two of them wrapped it in spices and strips of linen. This was in in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. The Jews buried people very quickly. (coughs) Here, Here we may wait a week, a couple weeks, The body is embalmed. When we were in Ethiopia, funerals happened within 24 hours. It was amazing to hear that somebody had died in the afternoon on Tuesday and see 500 people in the church for the funeral on Wednesday. And then the family already has a tent set up 
so they could feed all those people. The Jews were very quick. They would bury people the same day. So Joseph of Arimathea, accompanied by Nicodemus, took the body, aloe and myrrh, wrapped it in linen. Remember, the soldiers had taken his clothing, cast lots for it, and placed him in a tomb and rolled a big stone in front of the door. Some people object. Some people say he was never buried. He was witnessed. The burial was witnessed. In Mark, it says, by the ladies, the Marys, the two Marys, and some of the other women saw where they put Jesus. And they saw the stone that was rolled in front of the door. They probably also saw the seal of the government that was placed on that, saying, don't open it. And the soldiers that were there. But when they went back on Sunday, their conversation was, Who's going to roll the stone away? They knew where the tomb was. They knew he had been placed in the tomb. Who's going to roll the stone away? But they found it was already rolled away. And the body was gone, and the linen cloth was laying there, and the head wrapping was up by itself. And the angel explained to them, he's not here, he's risen. They went back and they told the disciples. And Peter and John ran immediately to the tomb. They knew where that tomb was. They knew where the body was. He had died and been buried. Now let me ask you a question. If he had only passed out, as some claim, and he came back to consciousness after being beaten and crucified, who would have rolled the stone away? Who would have given him a robe to wear as the apostles saw him the next time? Because in the tomb, he only had a, a sheet wrapped around him. We not only have the eyewitness testimony, but we have the physical evidence that's reported to us the stone was rolled away. And John says, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Uh, excuse me. Verse 35. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe that these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. That's John's way of saying, I saw it, I know it happened, and I'm telling you so that you too can know that it happened. Jesus died for our sins, according to the scripture, and he was buried.
Now let's take a look at the purpose of Christ's death. The purpose of Christ's death is to provide reconciliation for all men. In Romans 5, verses 10 and 11, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, so much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In the beginning, God created man. Male and female created he in them. And man chose his own way. He chose to rebel against God. And in doing so, he brought physical and spiritual death into the world. We call it sin. All are guilty. I'm guilty of sin every day. But because I have placed my faith in Christ, I have forgiveness. I have reconciliation. Only blood can atone for our sins. In Leviticus, there's an explanation. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15 says, Then he, that's the high priest, and only the high priest, he shall kill the goat of the sin offering for the people, I bring his blood inside the veil and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Once a year, Israel would celebrate the Day of Atonement, a day of special sacrifice. It only happened once a year. At first, the high priest would sacrifice a bull for himself and take the blood into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or in the temple. And then he would sacrifice a goat, a stubborn, old, mean goat. Any of you ever had a deal with goats? When our kids were littler, we borrowed one from a neighbor. He kept our lawn mowed. His name was Ichabod. I have a uh, crowbar, one inch metal bar that belonged to my grandfather. I used to drive it into the ground to hold Ichabod in place. He bent it. So they would take a goat and they would kill it and the high priest would take the blood into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant and in front of it to bring atonement for the people for that coming year. And he had to do it every year because the blood of animals doesn't bring permanent atonement. But then we read in Hebrews we read in Hebrews 9.24 that Jesus himself entered into the Holy of Holies not made with hands but the one up in heaven. 
And in chapter 9, verse 12, it says, He entered once and for all into the holy place, not by the means of blood of goats or calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Jesus paid the price with his blood. And for atonement, he entered into the holy of holy in heaven and presented his blood to the God. And then in Hebrews 10, 12, 10, 12 it says when he had finished, he went out and sat down. The priests were not allowed to sit. But Jesus sat down, indicating what he said on the cross in his last words. It is finished. It is done. This leaves us with a choice. Christ has paid the penalty for our sins. But we need only to accept the gift he offers. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's a decision each of us has to make at some time if we are to be reconciled to God. Now let's look at the third one. We've looked at the proof, and we've looked at the purpose. Now let's look at the power, the power of Christ's death. The gospel is more than going to heaven when you die. Some people think, if I receive Christ, I go to heaven, but that's the end of it. That's all there is. Romans 6.6 6 says, We know that our old selves were crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Jesus is our Savior our sanctifier, our healer, our coming king. The fourfold gospel. As those of the alliance, we hold to the fourfold gospel. And we see that we receive, we receive redemption from sin. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you are redeemed from the penalty of sin. The indictment of sin is written across it, paid in full. Paid in full. Christ has paid the price. We're no longer guilty. He's taken our guilt from us. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is the power of salvation. God giving us what we don't deserve. Faith is the channel that we receive it through. Nothing we can do 
can add to that or replace that. And then we see we are adopted as sons and daughters. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. There was a custom in the Roman Empire that a man who didn't have an heir, someone who received his inheritance, might select a faithful servant in his household and make him the heir by adoption. That servant might be a slave. So the first step he had to do was he had to redeem him from slavery. And Christ redeems us from slavery to sin. And then once he's redeemed, once he is free, he can be adopted. I had a friend I worked with. He was 42 years old. His father lived in Louisiana, his stepfather, and wanted him to receive the inheritance. But Louisiana law says you have to be adopted. So at 42, Jim was adopted, changed his name. At seven, I was adopted. I know people who were adopted even later on in life. First they're redeemed, and then God has chosen to adopt us. We stand. To stand is to live our lives as new creations in Jesus Christ. This is the sanctification, the growing in him in our present life. We stand in his grace. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We walk, we stand in his grace, and we walk. For we, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When I was 15 years old, I promised God, if you would give me the power, if you would give me the strength and the ability, whatever you ask me to do, I'd do it. When I was 17, our pastor decided the youth group would have the Sunday evening service once a month. And Mike, who is an extreme extrovert, Mike, who is an extreme introvert, although my wife won't say that, became the preacher boy. I can't do it. I can't get up here by myself. He gives me the power. He gives me the ability. Workmanship. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ. That word workmanship 
can also be translated masterpiece. Think of going into Rembrandt's studio or another famous artist, seeing a painting on the easel, and it's not done yet, but it's in progress, and you know that it will be a masterpiece. God is creating us as his masterpiece in Christ Jesus. And the third, we live eternally. Salvation is a process that will ultimately end with our being with Christ throughout eternity. The Christian and Missionary Alliance describes it as salvation, sanctification, and the return of the coming king. We were in Puerto Rico for a while. I like the way they say it in Spanish. It's not the return of the coming king. It is the king who is coming. He's already our king. In John 14, 1 to 3, we read, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. One day Jesus will return. One day the king will come back and he'll take each one of us that know him to be with him for eternity. Well, we've looked at the proof, the proof of Jesus' death burial. We've seen it supported by physical evidence, the empty tomb, the sheet, the rolled away stone, and by eyewitness accounts. Separate people saw it and testified to the fact that it happened. The death and burial of Jesus. And we looked at the purpose. It was done to bring redemption to all men. And then we've looked at the power. The power of Jesus' death is seen in that we receive redemption and adoption. We stand in his grace and his new, as his new creation and we have eternal life in him. The question is, where are you today? Where are you today? Do you need to receive him as your savior? Do you stand in him and need to grow into his likeness? Or are you like me? waiting for him to return so I can so be so we can be with him forever. Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for the proof that he died for our sins that it can be shown that that actually happened. And we pray that if there's one here this morning who has not made the decision to accept that gift, that you would speak to their hearts and you would 
bring them to yourself. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for that message. Had I known you were going to talk about Savior, Healer, Coming King, we could have done that Let's hymn. That and then the other thing you said was, um, you know, about the mansion. And there's a song, Vito, do you remember? It's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. Big, big house with lots and lots of food. It's a big, big yard where we can play football. <laughs> Maybe a little more whatever, but anyway, that was a funny one. But that's what came to mind. But you know, we have so much to be thankful for. The fact that we can stand knowing that when we have placed our trust in him, he's got us. He's got us. And he can grow us beyond what we ever expected. We just have to let him and be open to him. And so let's stand. We're going to sing our final song. You know, sometimes if you're going through something rough, it's really hard to sing. So if you ever find yourself in that on a, when we're finishing church, you know, don't, don't worry if you're not singing. Sing in your heart um, or sing in spite of what's going on, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus.
can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing your praise? <coughs> you who <coughs> gave your life that I might be redeemed. Redeemed and adopted into the family of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this, this congregation. We thank you for their faithfulness. We pray that you would, you would work here at Gateway Alliance to work out your will and your way. As they look for a senior pastor, we pray that you would provide the right man to guide them into growth in Jesus Christ. Father, as we go out, be with us. Help us to proclaim Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection until he comes again. We thank you in his name. Amen. <laughs>